بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله العالمين Ladies and gentlemen, my dear colleagues in academia, on behalf of my colleagues in the Forum of Heads and Supervisors of the Academic Departments, I would like first to thank His Excellency, the University President, Professor Abdurrahman Adyubi, for his patronage of the Forum activities. And to Professor and uh, thank Professor Abdelmanam Hayani, Vice President for Academic Affairs, for his continuous support of the Forum which is celebrating its second year. Special thanks go to Professor Yusuf Turki as well, Vice President for Higher Studies and Scientific Research, for his support of these webinars that are geared towards research strategies and innovation in academia. The eighth gathering of the heads and supervisors of the academic departments comes richly filled with brilliant strategies and high level interactive sessions. Our experts will cover topics of online assessment strategies, promoting research excellence towards the 2030 vision, essential learning outcomes for quality learning, post COVID-19 higher education, issues to consider in planning the return to campus, promoting quality online learning through faculty development and leading research and innovation in universities. Sharing the talk, however, will be the Arabic um, session presented by the Deputy Minister for Higher Education, His Excellency Dr. Abdurrahman Al Khrayif, on the efforts of higher education during the COVID 19 crisis and future trends. To mark the opening of this event that will span um, for two weeks, let me welcome Professor Abdelmanam Al Hayani to inaugurate the um, event on behalf of His Excellency the University President. Over to Dr. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الأمين Dear distinguished speakers, dear colleagues, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته On behalf of His Excellency, the President of King Abdulaziz University, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome everybody to this series of webinars organized by the Forum of uh, the heads and advisors and supervisors of the academic department at King Abdul's Universities. Uh, those series actually of uh, uh, webinars are coming in a, a crucial time. That's, this is the time of uh, the pandemic of uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, where uh, everybody actually is being challenged uh, by this pandemic, especially actually in higher education. Uh, we are uh, so lucky today by having uh, two of our uh, uh, colleagues and advisors to the King of the University, Professor uh, Judy McKim and uh, Dr. Paul Jones. They are going to talk about a very important topic that's making a big challenge for everybody in higher education. That is the assessment uh, through the online uh, teaching. Uh, I'd like actually to end my, my talk uh, by thanking the organizing committee uh, from the forum by their wonderful efforts to organize those uh, important and wonderful series of uh, uh, programs. And we hope everybody is enjoying and uh, uh, having this add value of uh, and contributing positively uh, throughout the coming two weeks. And let me end my, my talk by wishing everybody all the health and safety and uh, thank you so much again and uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, the introduction. Thank you very much Dr. Abdelmanam for this um, for these sweet words and um, um, our first speaker tonight is a highly experienced classroom teacher and workshop facilitator. She's an accreditor and reviewer as well. She has written and produced multiple publications and learning resources. She's an active member of a number of international medical education associations and activities. She's an expert in medical education, health professions, education, faculty development, educational and clinical leadership and management. It is Professor Judy McKen. Our next speaker is the head of the business department at Swansea University School of Management. He's a professor of entrepreneurship and innovation. He's an experienced academic manager and researcher and is currently editor-in-chief 
um, of the International Journal of Entrepreneurial Behavior and Research and Associate um, Editor of uh, or for the International Journal of Management Education. He's an expert in entrepreneurship, enterprise education, information communication technology, small business management. So um, please give a big round of virtual applause to both Professor Judy McCain and Professor Paul Jones. So it is um, your turn now, um, Dr. Judy, you may start. Glory Jules. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I couldn't unmute myself. So, um, salam alaikum, everybody. Fantastic to be here. Um, and in this very strange time of the COVID, um, I think it's fantastic that we're doing these webinars uh, with you. Um, I'm going to turn my video off uh, because of bandwidth, just to um, help the sound. So, um, Paul and I are going to talk about um, really looking at how we can assess our students effectively um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we'll do is run through a series of, um, of objectives. Next slide, please. You're right. Paul, next slide, thank you. In this global pandemic, um, it's had huge, as you've just said, really, it's had huge impact on teaching, learning and assessment for higher education, for universities right around the world. Many campuses have closed. We've had a shift to online learning. We know that some learning for some students cannot happen. And of course, what we're talking uh, about today is online assessment. I think we must keep in mind as well what we might call the downstream consequences. These are things that happen as a consequence of what we're experiencing. We've seen in many countries, including our own, that selection and entrance to university um, are affected because uh, school examinations, certainly here in the UK, have been cancelled and they're probably going to be cancelled for next year. And that has huge implications for us in, in selecting the next batch of students. And then, of course, the students in their final years, there are labour market and workforce outcomes for graduates there. And for all of us, faculty and students, there are psychological impact. So what we're going to have a look at is the impact on assessment for both teachers and learners thinking about how we may, might start to make uh, decisions, some of the choices we have, some of the options that we have. We'll stick with and reinforce the key principles of assessment because we must keep those in mind. But what we'll talk about is this shift to online assessment in terms of written, practical and professional assessments for those professional programmes. And then we'll, Paul will really pick up on that. OK, so what's about the lessons that we can learn? What might we take forward into what we might call the new normal? So if we start with um, a definition, I always think with anything, let's make sure we're on the same page as to what we're talking about. And so we're talking about assessment in terms of students, in terms of our learners. So the application of methods or tools that educators, teachers, administrators, used to evaluate, measure and document, record, the academic readiness, performance, learning progression, skill acquisition or educational needs of the learners. So for all of us in universities, we've got to think about where assessment fits in the process of learning. So why do we assess our learners anyway? Well, Firstly, we assess them against defined standards, learning outcomes and competencies. So what we're doing with assessments is making sure that our learners have achieved what we set out for them to achieve at whatever stage, their first year, second, PhD, whatever that is. We also need to use assessments so we can um, diagnose the progression ability of the students are they ready to progress to the next stage of learning, the next year or the next stage? Uh, do we have to hold them back for whatever reasons? Do they need some remediation? 
Assessment also enables us to give feedback to learners on their progression in their performance against our expectations, but also for faculty, assessment results give us a good indication of how well our teaching and learning processes are happening and how much students are learning. That's really important when we're thinking of shifting everything online, that we can get that feedback about, about how well we're doing. And of course, for the professional courses, law, accountancy, the health profession, social work, we've got to assure the public that professionals are safe and competent to practice. So there's an extra burden on the professional courses. So when we're talking about assessment, we need to distinguish between um, two types, really. Assessment for learning. This is what we might call formative assessment. It's developmental and we use it. We have formative exams, assessments, etc. Provide learners with feedback on their progress and give them lots of information as to how to improve to meet our learning outcomes. But the primary thing at the end, particularly at the end of the years or the end of modules, is thinking about summative assessment, assessment of learning. How well have students performed? How, what grade should we give them? What award should we give them? And the assessment of learning allows progression. And I'm mentioning this now because Paul and I will pick up on this because sometimes when we're in more of a crisis situation, we actually might need to focus on assessment of learning and perhaps park a little bit the assessment for learning because we've got to prioritise. So what's happened to our learners? Well, sudden closures of campus, hugely disruptive for our learners. Um, a lot of them, international students possibly have returned home, um, shift to online learning and huge disruption for them. Some students won't have places to study or they might not have uh, the ac good access to online learning, etc. And what does this lead to then? huge anxiety okay so one of the things we've had to manage with our learners and with our faculty is the psychological disruption and maintaining a well-being has been a big focus for us all i think in making sure that our students are safe physically safe but also psychologically safe because if they're going to do assessments and perform well then actually we need to be alleviating that anxiety as much as we can for them because actually we want our learners to progress. We don't want them to fail and falter really. So this is what our students tell us they're missing. Final year students are missing their graduation ceremonies and those, you know, the important sharing with their family and friends. And a lot of them are actually missing the social connection of their peers. Um, and we, we see this a lot with our students as they all return into their little isolated bubbles. So the next two slides really talk about some of the decision making questions that we need to ask ourselves. And in order to provide not just the learning, but in order to provide the assessments that are appropriate, we've got to think these questions through. So the first one is, where will students and faculty be located? Will our students be in their own homes? Will they be in student housing? Might some be on campus? Might some not be? And where are the faculty? Where are the teachers? And where are the administrative staff who need to support that assessment process? Okay. The second question then is really thinking about each of the cohorts in turn and what stage of the programmes have they, have they reached? We may want to think about about prioritising our final year students because of their graduation and the effect on their careers and work. Or we might decide all our students are equally important, or we might think actually it's really important to get the first years, make sure that they're okay to progress to the second year. Those decisions will depend on your programme, on the students that you've got and the capacity that you have. So we've got to think about that progression because the whole point, particularly at this time of year, is thinking about students progressing into the next year. 
Okay, so the progression is really important. And then, you know, as I said, are there any groups that we think need prioritising? For us at Swansea, um, we are both involved in the, the medical programme. We had to prioritise our final years so that they could be registered uh, to work and licensed to work in the, in the NHS. But for other courses, it might be different. Okay. So the second set of questions that we need to ask are about resources. What resources have we got available? Do we, can we bring students back in campus uh, in a safe, socially distanced way for assessment? Or do we have to assume that everything is on the cloud and, and web-based? What technology have we, ha have we got? What assessment um, technology, what software have we got? Do we need to buy more software? Is the, are the systems that we've got appropriate for online learning? Are they secure enough? So these are questions we need. And then, of course, this has come as a big disruption to all of us. Have the faculty actually got the skills and time to develop new assessments? Because when you're very used to running, you know, uh, exams in a, you know, in a, you know, with exam papers and producing them, and they would all be ready, having to put those online and make them available to everybody. Um, people might not have the technological skills, they might not have their, their assessments might not be adaptable to online learning and assessment and that's what Paul will talk about. And then the last two things really are about expectations and decisions. So what do our students expect and can we meet those expectations or are the things that we'll have to decide that we can't do and be very clear about that. And this is about decision making and communicating those to the stakeholders that need it, the students, the faculty, the administrative staff, all those involved in assessment. So really one of the things that we need to think about is thinking about risk and there are lots of risks with assessment anyway that we need to consider but thinking about the risk to online assessment so when we look at risk we can look at it in terms of three parts um, the threats to ourselves the vulnerability that our system or organization has and the assets that we have so let's talk with the threats first. So the three threats, which are the green ones, um, a big threat that we might have a high number of failures, or alternatively, we might have everybody passing where really we know that shouldn't be the case. So there is a risk there. Also a big risk in technological failures and another risk and the threat there of plagiarism and cheating. And Paul will talk more about this when he speaks. So these are some of the threats to our online assessment that we need to mitigate against and think about. Our vulnerabilities are the blue ones. They're a little bit similar, but um, they're where our organisation might be vulnerable and where we might have to think about mitigating against those vulnerabilities. So a lack of technology, the lack of capacity and that might be the university or it might be the students who are vulnerable because they might not have good bandwidth they might be in different time zones they might not have a, a place where they can do their assessment uh, in, a, in, in a good way and so of course you can build in if you're not careful inequities on online learning and online assessment that we do have to think about and certain groups of students will be more affected than others so not having access to learning resources or study space is something that, that might make certain students vulnerable. And of course, the big vulnerability for all of us is we make the best plans we can, but actually COVID-19 might just come and, you know, strike down a key member of staff or some students in a cohort. So we're very vulnerable always around this with the return of COVID. When we think about the assets that we've got then, and these are the strengths that we need to build up, our ability to convert our assessments online is something that we, we have to have. We've got to be, if we're going to offer them, we've got to have that ability. And also many universities have good technological capacity and skills, and also students, we've got digital native students here who are savvy as to how technology works and of course we've got the teacher's skills and not just their skills but their willingness to actually do the best for their students 
so one of the things that we we would suggest using and you've probably used this already but it can be go right down to module level this not just high high level university is some sort of risk matrix looking at the likelihood that something might happen again you're predicting here what might happen but you've got to think about the consequences of this risk so some things might be really likely to happen if you look at the left hand side and the, the orange there at the top but actually you can mitigate those so paul will talk about um assessment strategies that help to mitigate against risks at the other end the extreme risks then are very catastrophic or really major impacts on things but the ones we need to also think about are those in the middle that you know, do we put huge investment into online assessments for a one-off, or do we think, well, actually, we might actually even postpone an assessment, but then you might have reputational damage. Okay, so you're always balancing the likelihood of something happening in the decision you make with the potential consequences. But a risk matrix can be a very useful tool for that. So going back to the um back to the purpose of assessment always we've got to keep from an educational a pedagogical sense what biggs calls constructive alignment our learning outcomes how we've assessed the, how we've taught the students the learning activities the content that we provide with that assessment um, all three of those red circles have to be aligned so one of the issues I think sometimes with online assessment is, is what are we assessing the content of that assessment? Because if our learning has been disrupted, then obviously we can't assess what hasn't been learned. It might not have been taught, but it could have been learned. So we've got to reflect at programme level or module level about what that assessment can be. And it may be the assessments that we put together to happen just couldn't happen because the learning has been disrupted in such an extent. So let's just go to think of the other principles of assessment. So for assessment, and Paul's going to look at these in relation to the different types of assessment. Start with the yellow, okay, everything's colour coded in my talk. Um, so acceptability, the assessments have to be seen to be and actually be fair and equitable. So, for example, in an online assessment, if your students are scattered across various time zones, which they could easily be if you have a lot of international students to have gone home, then if you put something that's very suitable for, for Saudi time or UK time, a student in Australia or Indonesia or somewhere completely different, that might be two o'clock in the morning. Now, is that fair? Is that equitable? Okay, similarly, if you require students to do an assessment which requires a lot of access to um, other resources, but they haven't got that, it wouldn't be acceptable. Okay, so we've got to really think about acceptability. The green is validity and validity and the red reliability are the key things that we've got to keep in place. The assessment has to be valid. It has to measure what it's intended to measure. Okay, that's back to curri that curriculum alignment again. And it has to be reliable. Now, when we talk about re reliability in the non-COVID sense, what we're trying to do is make assessments reproducible between cohorts over time and by different assessors. And Paul will talk about this, but one of the things that we might have to sacrifice slightly uh, with online assessments in this COVID situation is reliability. It may be that the assessment that we design for this purpose in this moment in time is not as reliable as an assessment that we, that we would like. Okay, and that's something we might have to sacrifice. Then the blue is the educational impact. Now assessment drives learning. Here, in the COVID situation, what we might be thinking about is actually we want to assess the learning and assess students to the extent that they, we know that they're fit to progress or not. But actually, it may be that the driving of learning is not the key issue in this assessment at this time. So we may be looking at assessment for a different thing, assessment for progression and assessment of the learning and of the students 
are they fit to progress? That might be the baseline that we look at. So the bottom two are cost effectiveness and feasibility. So cost effectiveness, um, really here we're thinking about what's feasible, what, what's possible, but also you don't want something that costs an enormous amount for a one-off. So sometimes you might have to do that for a big high stakes exam just to get it done. But actually, the, again, the cost effectiveness needs to be thought about. That's where sharing uh, software, resources, ideas is really helpful to learn about doing things that are secure but cost effective. And then the final one of these principles is feasibility. Can we actually do it? There's no point, what do we say? Vision without action is hallucination. So there's no point thinking about, you know, can we do this fine and fancy online practical lab based exam? when you can't we haven't got the resources we've not developed it in that way at all it was designed to be in a laboratory or it was designed to be somewhere else so this is really an interesting thing about the resources and it may be as we go into the new normal that actually we've learned from this and we've got those resources so we're seeing in general um, some pendulum swings and shifts what we see in everything to do with learning is something's really trendy you know in one decade and then out of fashion and then back in fashion but what we're seeing now is we want to look at assessment of learning and for learning summative and formative okay we want to think about these more what we might call global assessments and we're seeing this in schools at the moment where teachers are being asked to say in general do you think this this student is fit to go progress to the next year and we've seen this in some universities that it's about taking what they've done so far are they on track to progress right rather than looking at individual competencies or learning outcomes we also want our students to stop recalling and um, regurgitating knowledge quite so much. But we need them to do some of that, but actually seeking and appraise knowledge. And Paul will talk about this because there are huge opportunities with online assessments and thinking a little bit out of the box for asking students to do assessments that are different from the ones that we would normally do. So he'll talk about that more. And then something that is a really fail safe thing and something that we should have been thinking about but so important now if we have emphasis on end of cycle assessments and high stakes final exams it's quite risky and i think what we've seen is programs who've had that have really struggled because all of a sudden that end of year has disappeared and the opportunity for that big bang final has sort of dwindled away. So thinking about more programmatic assessment, more course-based work, more sequential adding up actually is quite safe as well as good, good pedagogy. Next slide, Paul, thanks. But everything in life and everything with assessment is a balancing act. So we're balancing the learners' needs and concerns with the university and the teacher's capacity and concerns. The university needs to be still assured that they're awarding degrees and they're progressing students who are fit to progress. OK, so we still have to do that. You know, our reputations will be at risk if we didn't. But we've got to take into account our learners, that things have been really disruptive. And also, you know, what, what can we do? Um, so what we've got to keep in mind our core things are what's the purpose of these assessments why are we doing them are they needed are they not needed that's really core so keeping the purpose and principles of assessment but also making sure that it's super aligned to the curriculum so only assess what's been taught or being able to be learned in this time you can't agree agree with any more Oh, I think I'll see a question. We'll come to the questions at the end. OK, next slide, Paul. So just starting to bring my point, which is setting the scenes to a, to a close, really. We're assessing four areas and depending on the programmes, some are more uh, to the fore than others. So written assessment. What we're doing is testing knowledge, understanding and transferable skills such as communication or academic writing. 
a lot of programmes very ranging from geography to uh, laboratory based to professional courses have practicals assessment where skills are being tested. Okay, so written assessments probably quite difficult, but the most straightforward to shift online in a hurry. Practical assessments were starting to get into trickier waters. And for those courses who have workplace based practice, where we're looking at performance in the workplace, which is all our professional courses, where we might be on really sticky ground because they just might not have access to the workplace. They might have gone home and it might not be possible. So we might not be able to assess that at all for this time, this current time. And then again, for the professional courses, but also for other programmes, we're, set, we're educating students to be more than a knowledge repository. How do we assess those behaviours? So how do we look at thinking about the behaviours that we expect, teamwork and collaboration, all those things that we want our learners to be, uh, self-directed you know, self -directed learners, how are we going to assess those? And again, they might have to be um, parked. Okay, There's some strange chat. Can you just check that, please? I think we might have been um, hacked. Yes, please. Um, yeah. I'll carry on. I'll carry uh, on. Yes, please. Yeah. Just ignore the chat because it'll be it'll be um, giving you the questions later on. Yeah. There's some. There's, I think you've been hacked because there's some strange language on your You're chat. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. So for each type and time of assessment that we need to have a look at. Um, is do we have to run this assessment now or even at all so can we afford to allow students to progress without an assessment or can we postpone an assessment to the subsequent year okay so that's one question um, can we run this assessment at a distance and can we run it online to measure the students can it is it possible we're back to feasibility again and may some students be advantaged or disadvantaged and that's really important I think to think of that equitable uh, space especially students with perhaps learning disabilities or other, or other um, additional learning needs how will we mitigate against cheating really important we don't we don't want to reward students for something that they haven't done and then how will we give feedback uh, and that might be something, again, that we might have to just think, actually, the feedback isn't going to be the, the best that it can be, but at least we've got our students through this into the next year. OK, so just some general points, really, then. I think we, we think written assessments are probably the easiest to run online, the most straightforward. Um, Paul will talk about this and give some examples, but open book assessments where students are asked to we know that they have access to the whole world. What we're asking them is to sift through that knowledge and resources and actually apply that knowledge rather than recall. Because, because recall, if we have students aren't in the room, they could easily cheat. Okay. Allowing more time to complete assessments will help to reduce inequalities. And we've seen some universities have had assessments running open book for a whole week. Um, very different way of thinking about, you know, especially when you're used to exams and everybody being in room, one room for two hours. But actually, it is how the real world works. And this might be something we take forward. And as I said earlier, we might just have to cancel or postpone practical or workplace assessments if students can't get to the workplace. Paul? So just I'm going to summarise my, my part, really, and then if we've got any questions, we can take them. Keep the core purpose and the principles of assessment in mind for every assessment that you're choosing. Do we have to do it? How can we make it valid and as reliable as possible? And is it possible? Is it feasible? Carry out a risk assessment, because I think that's quite a useful exercise. Definitely plan for uncertainty in a changed world. So really mitigate against those risks and do things that are safe. They might not be as good as, as what you'd like to do, but at least they'll work. Um, think about students' differential circumstances and think about potential inequalities. Um, and don't be afraid to postpone or cancel assess assessments. You might have to focus on certain groups or summative assessment over formative. And just as we're doing now, share practice and learn from others. You know, we're all in this COVID-19 situation together. 
we have to keep our universities' reputations and make sure our learners are safe and competent. But actually, we're all learning, and I think you know this is this is so important. So that ends what I would like to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yudi. So the floor is yours now, um, Paul. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And what we're going to go on now to talk about is thinking about how we start to put some of this in place. As Julia said, we need to think about, always whenever you think about change, and this is very much a change, you need to think about where you are in the current situation. And we know that Judy has already talked about written assignments, practical assessments, workplace-based practice, and professionalism. These are the four areas in any programme that you may be assessing. Obviously, as Judy said, you might be testing some of them more in some programmes than others. But I think the first thing, and I always like to look at the very positive before, I think we always look at the negative, we always think of the challenges. I think a better way to do it is to look at what the opportunities this gives us. I think this is, gives us the opportunity for a new way of learning. Further development of e-learning resources, and some programmes already have good e-learning resources associated with them. But I think this has pushed us into a situation where we need to do a lot more. There is the potential, because you have to set up new resources, for a curriculum review, to start looking at the content of your curriculum. You're gonna to have to spend a lot of time and resources on development of, of new information, of new data, of new learning materials, then that's a very good time to think about actually what's in your curriculum. Also gives us the opportunity to review assessment practices. It, I'll talk a little bit later about culture, about the way in which we do things. Always used to assessing things in a certain way, but this has given us the opportunity to look at that with fresh eyes and think, well, we can't do it in the normal way. How else can we do it? Another opportunity is getting the students more involved. Lots of programmes might have students involved on some committees, but actually getting students involved because they are the ones who are going to have to, have to access all the e-learning resources you produce. And it's no good really producing very, very good resources if it's something which the students then can't interact with and engage with and use as a, as a beneficial tool for learning. Another opportunity is learning from others. It's what we do all the time. It's part of leadership. It's starting to make connections, starting to connect people up and learning what people are doing either locally or even in internationally. So starting to think about what are they doing? How are they doing it better? How can we learn from that? And then I think the, the final opportunity is creating a new way forward. Always going to be a challenge because where we're in this era of change, change is always very difficult. And as Julie said, change sometimes produces high anxiety. And I think starting to think about a new way forward, you need to think about how you get people to get to come along with you. So let's think about some of the challenges. I think the biggest challenge that we have is changing the culture. Bauer in 66 talked about culture being the way we do things around here. Just thinking about you can't just put out an email and say we're going to change. It needs to be planned, people need to be talked to, people need to be brought around to the new way of learning, as well as students. And it is very much that collaboration with everybody. Another challenge is educating the faculty. Some staff may have good experience with using e-learning. I know that when we started using Zoom, there were lots of people in the university who weren't able to actually access it. Particularly when you have programs where you might have outside speakers coming in, they might be used to different services. And therefore it's getting everybody educated into the new way of working, whatever platform you choose to use. Resources, a biggest challenge, particularly now as universities, particularly with numbers dropping in universities, some students are choosing to take a year out. We've seen in the UK particularly, 
a lot of students decided to take what we call a gap year. It's taken a year before they come to university because they can see the situation that's happening with the crisis in the world. And I think some of them think that they is worth waiting, traveling around a bit, and then going, coming to university the year after. And therefore, finances in universities are sometimes difficult. And also one of the resources is faculty with expertise. We often talk about resources being material things, but our staff are part of our resource. And getting the people who have got the expertise to work with you can be sometimes difficult. Getting the students and the staff to go along with you. This is all about change. This is about people buying into your vision about what you want to do and actually getting them to feel part of that change process. Another challenge is actually implementing what you want to do. As Judy said, there's no good talking about it, no good having the vision without actually putting that into action. So you actually need people on the ground who will actually be able to implement the new way of working. Cotter in 1996 talked about, about remember that change sticks when it becomes the way we do things around here and again this is very difficult because we're making changes now to accommodate the COVID-19 virus we're not sure of which those of, of, of those changes which are going to stick and which are not and therefore it's very important to think about this might be a temporary change, or you may decide in time because it might work better to make it a permanent change. And obviously, one of the biggest challenges, I think, is changing the progression rules and the policies that you have in a very quick way. It's trying to work with the university and trying to think about how you can get that done is constant backing and throwing from your university resources. Now we know that the learning is best when it is real, when it is real life and relevant, when it's experiential, when it's active, and when it's learn or community focused. But sometimes you have to accept, particularly under the current circumstances, that may not be achievable at the moment. And therefore we need to think about what considerations you need to do. Some of them are, do these assessments need to happen right now? Could it be that they can be postponed? Or indeed, do they need to be done at all? And this will feed into the aspect of going forward, will you be using all these assessments in the future? Or will you decide that the way we've done it now under the restrictions has worked very effectively in actual fact, it was a better way of doing it. And if you do have to do assessments, can they, can they be carried out safely for all participants of faculty and students? We've talked about personal protective equipment in terms of starting to think about how you can gather people together. And as time goes by, the numbers of people in smaller areas might increase. But that's going to take time. What I'm going to think about is, are the considerations, is, are they valid, are they acceptable, are they feasible, cost-effective, authentic, and what is their education impact? Similar to what Professor McKim talked about is going through those areas. The other aspect to consider, to consider is, do they provide feedback to the students? We often think about summative assessments, if you pass them, do you progress, if you don't, but it's starting to think about how we can still give feedback to students, even though they might not be present. And then do they need to be summative, or could they be formative? One of the things that we're doing in Swansea is that with our third year medical students in their penultimate year, it was we were unable to run their final OSCE in the third year. And that will obviously disadvantage them going through to their final year. So what we are planning at the beginning of the next academic year in September, October, is to run that exam, but we're not going to make it summative. 
because they've already progressed into that final year, but we're going to use it in a very formative way to give them very feed, good feedback about where they are, and that will then prepare them for their final OSCE, their final exam later on in the year. So I think the first, we'll go back to the assessment principles we talked about in, initially. And I think the first one to be talking about is the written assessments. Now we know that written assessments test knowledge, understanding and transferable skills. And if we go through each of the headings, acceptable. Yes, we know they're going to be fair, but we also need to think about, are they fair in terms of putting risk assessments online? Are they going to be having access? Have they got good computer access? Have they got the resources, has all everybody got the same sort of resources in their own homes? Validity. How well the assessment measures what's intended to measure. Yes, a lot of the things that we're doing at the moment, we actually use written assessments and we could use them in a very similar way. Reliability. Again, we've got data to indicate how we've used written assignments and written assignments, even though they might be physically handed in or they might be put in through a, an e-learning platform, we know that they are reproducible. The educational impact. Again, those, these sorts of assignments shouldn't change the way in which we are learning. Cost effective. Obviously, the cost effectiveness at the moment is that we might not be getting students to work on one-to-one -to, -one to get support for those written assignments. But as we are doing today through Zoom, you can give support and you can give advice through different mediums. And feasibility. Again, a lot of the assignments that most universities utilize recently now is through an online method. And examples of these are self-testing. So we know that increased resources being made available for all programs around the world. I like just talking to colleagues across the world, I know that lots of resources which you normally have to pay for are now being made available free for certain courses. I'll give you two examples from our own course. That in, we run a medical course in Swansea and we've recently had information of what we call capsule. And Capsule is a clinical and professional studies unique learning environment. And it's a quiz-based learning resource designed to support undergraduate medical students. And that has been made available to all the medical students in the UK for free. It has been paid for by our Medical Schools Council. And the second one is speaking clinically. This is a way in which all the students can access short scenarios of people talking about their illnesses. But these are just two examples of the sorts of resources that are being made available. Online submissions of tests. Again, not that different now, whether you use Turnitin, whether you use some sort of plagiarism tool, a lot of, it, a lot of tests are submitted online. If I were to go back and think about of children of school age, Parental testing. Now, how feasible is that in university? It's difficult, but we know that the, at the moment there are parents teaching their children and administrating tests at home. Could you have that same sort of principle within geography or history? And how would you then think about alleviating that in terms of the risk of cheating? We know that if we have examinations online for all candidates, there is a increased risk of cheating. You don't know what they're doing at that time. And there are quite a few areas which are giving slightly longer. So they know that students are going to be using resources to undertake the exam, and therefore they give them a longer period of time. Open book, what we call open book exams. And that decreases the risk of cheating because what you're saying is that you can use whatever resources you need to answer the question. And it might be that we go away from asking, as Judy said in the beginning, about asking specific bits of information, but we have more essay type assignments. Again, you've always got the risk of essays being written by other people, 
but in time as you get to know your students, you know what their writing looks like, and that you can think about how you can alleviate that. As I said, it has become an unexpected COVID-19 side effect for universities. The second aspect to be thinking about is skills testing. And again, skills testing, is it fair and equitable? It's very difficult to think about how you might test a skill. You might observe them doing a skill through Zoom. You might actually want to bring them into a lab situation or something like that so that you can actually assess them. But you'd have to have personal protective equipment to make sure that you are both safe. Validity. Yes, you're not going to be able to. If you do it through Zoom, you can't see all the in intricacies. If you're testing a skill, can you see exactly what they're doing? Again, reproducibility. People are going to be working under different circumstances, and it's difficult to know how reliable that is. And as Judy mentioned originally, sometimes you need to sacrifice that reliability to, to find that one, can the students understand it, and then does it become more valid? The educational impact. Thinking about all the time that assessment drive learning is thinking about how we can do it in the actual situation. Cost effectiveness. We know that cost, from a cost effectiveness point of view, if you, uh, if you were all to do the assessments from home and you to observe them, then that could be very cost effective. But I think that the minute you start thinking about bringing students into an environment, the increased cost that you have, because you can only have smaller groups of students being assessed at one time, or you're going to have to use personal protective equipment, and therefore you can think about how the cost can spiral. And you need to balance, as Judy said, you need to balance that. Is the extra cost really worth what we're going to find out about it? Or is it something that can be delayed for the following year? We can, we can get them to understand the principles behind it, but could we test the actual skill later on? And have we the resources to carry out this assessment as developed? Starting to think about how you can do that makes it very difficult. And obviously thinking about some online examples of online practical exams. In the BMJ recently, they talked about the development of a web OSCE using Zoom teleconferencing. And if you have any course that in involves a practical skill, starting to think of how you could use that to, to facilitate it. Some institutions have indeed cancelled exams. And I know recently Cambridge have cancelled all their final clinical exams due to the COVID crisis. And therefore, I think we need to think about how we would do that in terms of practising. And then obviously getting practice through Zoom or another communication platform. Is how reliable this then points back to the resources is that do the students have the ability on their computer? Have they got the bandwidth? Julie talked in the beginning about turning her video off because it reduces the amount of bandwidth you use. And if you're trying to use a practical example, you're trying to run practicals, then you need to be able to see and therefore people need to have their videos on. And that sometimes can lead to a halting or a, a interference with the, with the actual system that you're using. Third place is workplace-based practice. This is where we're starting to think about performance in the actual workplace. And we know that this is very difficult. From an acceptability point of view, it might not be as fair put students in a workplace situation where they're going to be exposed to other people in terms of the, not the virus. Again, if you could get them to an area with suitable protective equipment, then it should be a valid exam. But what we need to think about is that we're not going to be carrying out those procedures or those things in the workplace in the same way once the virus is gone. And therefore, how do we change the assessment because of that? Reliability. We haven't got the data at the moment to think about how you can reliably run this because we haven't been through it before. We know from an education impact point of view 
that the assessment they're doing will encourage them to actually learn what they're meant to be doing. And in terms of cost effectiveness, it's trying to think about how we can communicate with all the places they're meant to be working and is it feasible. And if I give you some examples, that we need to accept that sometimes this just cannot be done. Field work, you think about areas of geography, might be possible, for example, but I think there is limited exposure to the workplace with precautions that you need to use for personal protective equipment. And the final one is assessment of behaviours. Again, I think this is not going through the actual slides, but thinking about professionalism, very difficult to assess this aspect as all the contact you've got at the moment has been severely restricted. It may be that you can assess them in terms of team working in projects. It might be that if you are carrying out online teaching, that you are assessing professionalism attitudes through the behavior that people respond when you're carrying out a lecture. But you are really relying on information coming into you to tell you how professional that pe those people are being. And then the final thing is about thinking about opportunities for feedback. And we've often said that an assessment is wasted in educational terms if the learners do not learn from it. We need to think about how learners receive feedback in their performance, which would be time, perspective, and specific. A useful book to think about is thanks to feedback, the science and art of, feed, of feed, receiving feedback well. And as you can see, I've got lots of comments here in terms of thinking about how you could perhaps make it better. What sort of feedback? And I think we do need to think about students all the time in terms of how we can make sure they have effective feedback. So what strategies can we put in place? We know that communication is paramount with both faculty and students, and you need efficient organization to plan it. So I said initially, you might think about working with students, but you also need to use robust software, which is secure. I and mean, then we've seen today on, on the Zoom is that some, some, some people are going to hack into Zoom so how secure is it? But it also needs to be reliable. It needs to be sufficiently to be able to take the numbers that we've got. And I think looking at the numbers we've got now, we've got over 400 people. And therefore, this platform is able to sustain that. So you need to have something reliable. We also, one of the strategies you need to think about is thinking about time zones. Allocating certain times with students at home, but also if they're in another time zone, what time do you then carry it out? Do you carry it in the normal time? They may be disadvantaged. Or do you change the time so it tries to suit more than one people? And I think with all these aspects, one of the strategies you think about is having appropriate admin support. It's very difficult to administer any sort of program without the appropriate admin support. And as Judy said, a lot of the admin support at the moment are working from home and therefore we haven't got that interaction as much. We've got a lot of Zoom meetings, we can talk to lots of people, but something, nothing beats actually being with people and learning from them by actually observing what they're doing. So what lessons have we learned? That we know that the role of technology in M-learning or e-assessment in terms of simulation self-assessment and selection, we know that it needs to be more personalised, tailored assessment and thinking about feedback and profiling. The idea of open source assessments, so thinking about seeking and appraising the information as opposed to just regurgitating and not just remembering. And this idea of thinking about programmatic assessment and coursework rather than relying on what we call the Big Bang final exams for any programme. So 
So planning for the new normal. And I know we have a session coming up on planning for the new normal, but coming back to university. But do we go back to what we used to do before COVID? What lessons can we take forward from the crisis? And the idea of programmatic assessment, where you're thinking about doing it over longitudinally, as opposed to just having big finals exams, may be, might be the way in which we do it. So in summary, we know that consideration needs to be given to both written, practical assessments, workplace-based practice, and professionalism. And we know that there are many, many examples in the educational field, but communication is vital to both faculty and staff. And more importantly, what do we use from what we have learned during the crisis? Are we going to be able to learn things that we know that we're going to be taking forward? And then are we going to be thinking about other things? Thank you very much, Paul. Okay. And um, thank you, Judy, as well. Maybe we didn't have time to thank you enough for that. But uh, thank you guys for this um, wonderful talk, very inf informative um, presentations. And it uh, seems like uh, you have uh, triggered a lot of questions in the chat. Um, uh, we have um, closed the chat, um, uh, but um, um, attendees can still DM the uh, moderator, uh, the moderator for the. Um, I mean, if they have any um, questions, uh, I've got some questions for um, Judy. Yes. Uh, yes, please. Um, um, one of the slides uh, was um, um, actually included um, um, uh, the risk matrix. Um, yes. Some researchers are asking about the reference of that uh, matrix. Maybe they are, you know, um, keen on using it maybe later on in their research or something. Okay. Um, there's no one reference. Um, what I did was um, have a look at different sorts of risk, risk matrices and I made it from those. So it's a combination of ones that are easily available um, wow. online because these are really commonly used tools. So there's loads of risk matrices. If you just go on Google images and do risk matrix, you'll get about a million. So I just pulled together um, what I thought was, uh, for me, this one with the likelihood and the consequences is really useful. And then I just sort of worked it through. So it's a mixture of a, a few different ones, but they're so freely available. It's, it's not really a reference thing anymore because they're an open source. There isn't now because they're common, so common. It, it's everybody, you know, they're just a management tool. So it would be like a SWOT analysis or a, a PESL, you know, they're just management tools. So, yeah. um, yeah. but one of the ones that we we like uh, is the chat open again. Can I put something in it or not? Um, in the chat, you mean? Yeah, I'll put something. Um, there's something that we use, which is um, if you there's, if you can just Google. Um, it's called business balls, as in business, and then balls, as in things you throw in the air, all yeah. one word. And they've got loads of really good uh, resources on there for business. So you would find a, a risk matrix in there. But I made this one up. I just fiddled around with a few. Great. Thank you very much. Another question for Judy as well. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, this is from some maybe computer geese. Um, they, uh, the question is, um, can a, um, like artificial intelligence and modeling can be used um, to develop types of assessment? Definitely, but, but it's, are we, I think what hits us all a lot, I mean, I do loads of online learning uh, and online assessment, <clears throat> but I think what hits us all with the suddenness of the crisis is we just aren't equipped as universities. So I think over time, you know, algorithmic assessments, uh, the ones that use, uh, that take tailored profiles of students and work out assessments that incrementally demand more from them. These are all out there, but I'm not sure any of us are really using them to their full capacity. So I do think that these will come, but I think, you know, they're, they're a bit few and far between, certainly with you know, normal faculty like us. But one of the things I was thinking, which is a bit away from what you were saying, is you know, use the tools that you've got as well. So if you, you, know, if you use Blackboard, 
use the assessment tools on Blackboard, you know, there's quizzes, there's all those things that you can actually use. Um, but I do think over time, and this will be something that we'll learn, is let's work out how to use these more algorithmic um, artificial intelligence assessments. But I'm not sure most of us are there yet, but I think they will come. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Actually, most people are concerned about the psychomotor um, uh, uh, competences. So um, do, do you think this... Um, uh, type of competency uh, can 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 still be um, assessed with uh, you know online um, means of um, assessment. Yeah, I mean, I'll let Paul talk, but certainly some of them. So, for example, um, places like the Open University, who have their virtual microscope and their virtual laboratories, they're very used to online assessments of practical tools because their students are all over the world. I think for most of us, we very much rely on the students being in the same room as the instructor and we set up our whatever the practical is and they do it and then we, you know, if it's chemistry or physics or whatever it is. So I think some disciplines are probably easier than others. So, for example, physics, especially theoretical physics, is, you know, you could do that quite easily online. Whereas something like archaeology, how would you do that online? You know, that could be quite difficult. But geology... You might be able to because you so I think it depends on the subject discipline, certainly for medicine and Paul will answer more for you know because obviously where from the medical or health professions, um, a lot of the skills have been quite difficult, but we have heard of people um, like some of the, uh, the, the, the non invasive examination skills that tutors have been observing um, their students perhaps performing uh, listening to a heart or something with a family member and observing those and assessing them so there are ways around it but you know you it, we're not great at this yet and I do think it depends on the discipline did you have anything to add Paul on that? Yeah I think one of the challenges and I think someone's just asked me a, a, a question separately about if students don't want to enable their videos and I think we've had that and I've and I talked to colleagues around the world who have said that they've had some lectures where students just don't want to engage. They're quite happy to sit there passively and listen, but sometimes you need that interaction. And I think particularly now that we have students, particularly our medical students, our nursing students, and indeed all our, our, our local students working, not necessarily in healthcare, but other disciplines, have started working for our National Health Service. So they are helping in different ways to support our medics and our nurses and our physiotherapists on the front line and therefore they're not always available at that particular time and I think what we've, what we've said to our students is we would like to record the teaching sessions so that those ones who one who can't be there can go back and look at them we've had some students say no I don't want to be recorded I don't want you to record the session because I'm not willing for you to involve myself and I think part of it is just a new way of thinking is thinking how we can get students to get quite along to it. One way is to do a lot smaller groups, but then that does require then you to have repeated things. You might have to repeat the same thing three or four times. Or that you would have perhaps a seminar, you would have a large group, and then you use the function on Zoom to actually put people in groups. So people are in smaller groups, and you can then start to thinking about how you can use it to actually assess in your smaller groups before you come back into the main one. So, but I think it's exceptionally difficult in terms of the skills of if students don't want to share their videos for whatever reasons. It might be that they're embarrassed about where they live. It might be that they haven't got the, the bandwidth in terms of being able to support video. And therefore we need to think about making allowances for all these things. Um, actually, one of the questions is about cameras and that some students are reluctant, you know, to, to use cameras. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, do you think that formative assessment um, can be sufficient in, um, in these cases? I it's think you just have to decide what you felt. You, you're right back to the beginning, aren't you? Back to the constructive alignment, back to the purpose. If you are trying to assess that somebody can do, if we stick with the practical skills, if you're trying to assess that somebody can do a practical skill and you need to observe them, 
doing it, then you have to, if you're doing it remotely, then you have to be able to observe them and they would have to, to do that. I think the teaching is one thing, but the assessment is another. And if your assessment is summative and it's required, then of course they would have to, otherwise that would be like a student not turning up to an exam. You'd have to think about what, how your, um, your rules would apply in that situation. Um, but if they're on a course and they are meant to be uh, undertaking a, a summative assessment that's mandatory or a formative mandatory, then they have to appear in whatever way. Um, I mean, you know, some things in practical terms could be a lot easier, you know, computer based things and things like that, the practical skills, but things where you're requiring students to, to be observed then they would have to be able to be observed but most of them won't be possible i don't think and that i think the practical skills is is one of our challenges uh, mm -hmm. as well as the workplace yeah but mm -hmm. you know i think your students have obviously they could be veiled you know if they if they wear the veil but but i still think they have to be present because you've got to be assured it's that person and you know and have that relationship i think I can, um, see one, I can see one question where somebody is asking about when I talked about our current third years before they went into their final year. I was the program director for a medical program and we have third year students in a penultimate year of medicine going through into their final year. At the end of their third year, we were unable to run their clinical exams. So we were able to run the knowledge-based exams we can progress test or single best answers, MCQs and things like that, and, and assignments, but we weren't able to run the practical elements. And what we made the decision as a faculty to do is let those students go through into the final year, knowing that they would have their finals exam in probably February of next year. But we wanted them to be better prepared, so we converted the exam that they would have sat at the end of third year, and we're going to run it in September, October, but we're going to make it formative. So we're going to not make it so that they, because they've already progressed into that year, so we'll give them very, very good feedback with that exam, and then we can get them better prepared for their finance exam. And I think the other, the other question that people are asking about the resources of Capsule and Speaking Clinically, are they available for international students? They are available to all UK students, whether it be international or home, but I don't think this is something which the medical school council has set up. They're not available for outside of the UK, but I, if you want to, I can give you the link so that you can liaise with the people who set it up. Um, Capsule was set up by Brighton and Speaking Clinically was set up in Imperial. So I can give you the links for those if you want to, that you can liaise them, but I'm sure if it's outside of the UK, there will probably be a cost involvement. Okay, great, okay. Um, so um, one of the um, questions is about cancelling exams. Um, um, do you think it is um, possible to, to cancel exams and rather focus on other means of assessment? I think sometimes you might have to. I mean, I think this is the issue, that um, if you're cancelling, you, there's a difference between postponing and cancelling, isn't there? You know, postponing might be, okay, let's wait for September or let's start our uh, academic year earlier in August and let's put an exam in there, like Paul described, the formative exam, just so that you, really so that you're making sure that students are up to speed and that you can remediate if you need to. But if you're cancelling an exam, you've got to think about the consequences of that. And that is why I think the risk you know, when I have the three circles of the risk matrix, that's really useful, I think, because then you're thinking, what are the, what are the risks of the consequences? So if you cancel an exam and it's a fundamental building block to assure that the students are fit to progress to the next year, how will you know that the students can progress, are fit to progress? So, and the other consequences of cancelling exams are that students will just get a little bit, they'll get hacked off and they just might disengage and that is a consequence sometimes um so that's worth think you know the consequences could be all sorts of things but i think you've got to weigh every exam up with every cohort and just think you know because your resources are finite and so you can't do everything 
And so you've really got to prioritize. Um, so I, I think that's what I would say. Okay, so didn't you think that the risk metrics can, can help in this, in, um, in deciding? Yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's why we put it up, because, um, because it's always about risk. You're mitigating risk, aren't you? And, um, and you're trying to think about, um, about, about how to manage risk. If you've got a really good cohort of students and you've had, they've not really struggled and there's, there's not many that are struggling, then you might think, do you know, I think I can let these students progress. I can assess them formatively at the beginning of the year and I can just make sure they're on track and remediate. If you've got a cohort that you were quite worried about or a group of students in a, in a year group and you thought, do you know, this is quite a weak cohort, you might make a different decision. Okay, so it's dependent, you know, you've got to, we'll, it, it's never going to be perfect, but we've got to, uh, we've got to make those, those things. And the other thing is, I think it was really interesting when Cambridge said that they weren't doing this, everybody went, oh, Cambridge, Cambridge aren't doing it. Well, maybe we can, because of the prestige of the university. So I think that was quite interesting. You know, if you're a, a good university with a good reputation, it may be that you can take a bit more risk because people will be backing you. Um, but what you don't want is to end up in a situation where people think that your graduates down the line um, are not good. You know, you oh, want right. to be very assured. I've just sent you a link. Um, I, was just, uh, I was just having a look at this open university. So I've sent you a link, which is about um, education in chemistry. And it's teaching uh, practical chemistry. It's what I was talking about with the Open University. And they have this thing with um, this develop, it's a globally accessible online laboratory and they can use rigorous investigations using real data. And it's, um, it's a on completely online practical science uh, assessment and learning resource. So that's an example of what is possible in the, in the, um, in the sciences. One of, the, one of the questions that somebody has asked is what are the options for fine year students? And I know I talked about penultimate year students, but what do you do about fine year students who are meant to qualify at the end of this academic year? Now, and I can talk from experience in terms of in Swansea, we were very fortunate that we, win, we run our clinical exams a lot earlier than some of the medical schools. And therefore, before the crisis has hit, we had already put our students through a clinical exam and a knowledge-based exam, and there were very, very few students who were, and, and therefore the reset that we had to do was very, very small numbers. Now, we know that there are some medical schools who we have been unable to do that, and what they have done is they have either looked at previous data so they have looked at the, the um, exams that people have sat beforehand and thought about were they likely, or is their trajectory, trajectory likely to achieve the exam? Because if you haven't run exams now, then for large groups of students, it may be impossible to do that. And therefore, that's what you'd have to do is think about looking back on the data that you've had. Can you look at their clinical skills? Have you got some data from previous years? And that's a very difficult situation. I think there are some schools that actually did that in the UK and they progressed students without to, qualifying as doctors without a final examination to say, yes, you've got it in terms of the practical skills. But what they had to do was make some very difficult decisions based on information they had from the tutors that were teaching them and the clinical teachers that had been working with them before the crisis happened. You can, you can imagine telling the students they're not qualifying because generally we don't think you're good enough would have been a very difficult conversation in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's something that needs to be done. We need to make sure that we are putting out there people, if they come out, if they're doing a geography, if they're going to be issued with a geography degree, then we need to make sure that they've, they've got the necessary skills and the knowledge to demonstrate that compared to other people. So again, it needs to be fair in terms of, you can't just say you're going to have your degree, you need to make sure that it's okay. Hmm. Does that answer your, your question? 
Right. Uh, well, you were ask, you were answering uh, somebody's uh, question in the. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm I'm asking the person who asked the question. Yes, she said yes. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, another question um, for Judy, maybe. Um, um, are you with or, or against the um, fail or pass, um, you know, uh, like black and white assessment? <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, I'm chuckling because I, I'm very much about rewarding students for the effort and the learning that they've done. So I'm very much for as a grading person. I like to reward those who need to, do, uh, you know, get 90 percent distinction as opposed to those who just scrape their way through. However, I think in the COVID situation, with what we've seen across universities is they've very much gone for a pass-fail. Like because we haven't got, as, it's really reflecting what Paul said earlier, if we haven't got out enough aggregated data to make a grade prediction, and actually let's let those students, a particular progression, and of course, what we're doing then is we're limiting students down the line because they might not be able to then perhaps get, you know, a first class in our system, you know, a first class honours or whatever. And I think we've seen this in universities and we've also seen this in schools. So what we've seen is that, for example, the A-level system in the UK, there's a big debate at the moment because the grades are going to be predicted on students, on teachers' uh, predictions and their assessment of students. And we know that uh, some groups of students like black, black and ethnic minority students underperform, are underperform, they're predicted to underperformed by teachers whereas the white students are predict they've got a bit of a halo effect so i think one of the things sometimes you might go you know this is a unique situation you're a covid cohort and you have not got a grade okay and what we might have to do is jump these students over so that what we don't do is aggregate from this year and we have to just let students progress so my son is in the same position he's doing physics um, at university he's in his third year just going into his master's year next year and they've just been given a pass fail now he's cross because he's done really well and he's online for a first but what the university is doing is saying this year really will not count unless you've failed okay this year won't be counted against your uh, you know your degree classification so it may be that we have to make some judgments this year that this is a different cohort of students. So normally I'm very much for grades, but this year it may be that if we haven't enough data to predict a grade accurately and fairly, then it may be that we just have to identify the students who are struggling and work with them and let the others just progress through. So sometimes you've got to make very pragmatic decisions, even though pedagogically, we much prefer to mark to the range, you know, and reward the student, the good, very good students for their effort and their work. But, you know, we're in a really different, difficult situation at the moment. We've got to make decisions that don't, don't have too adverse consequences for our students down the line, I think. Yeah, thank you. But um, the things that um, those who are for the pass and fail um, solution, um, have noticed that there is like great inflation. I mean, most students, you know, uh, earn um, A's or A pluses. So uh, maybe this is one of the concerns why some people, like uh, some teachers, have tended to um, to choose the other the, the other way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's al there's always a risk, and and we you know we always we always see such a difference when we we work in Saudi or perhaps in the States where, you know, we would mark from 50 right through to 100. So some students might get 55 and some might get 99. Whereas, you know, they're much more compressed in the US and the Saudi system, you know, where somebody got 55 in Saudi, it would be like a catastrophe. Whereas some of our master students get 55. It's like you need to work a bit hard, <laughs> but yeah. you haven't failed. So, you know, it's taking the context into consideration. Um, but you know sometimes we might just have to accept that that we can't fairly and equitably give grades and that's why i think one of the lessons we have to learn from this covid thing is let's let's build in sequential 
programmatic assessment so that we are if anything happens at any time in the year we've got enough data to make these decisions because if everything's left to the final exam uh, and perhaps just a little bit of coursework say 30 percent 70 percent is riding on something that you might not be able to deliver fairly and that's really difficult situation for everybody so i think for me that's one of the biggest lessons i've taken from what's happened because of the timing in the in the academic year that it happened you know that mark for us march we're still we're still, in, we're still not back in university we won't be back till september we'll, you know that's a big time for most exams so i think that yeah so i'm drifting off the topic a little bit but that's one of the big lessons i've taken from this another question the one other question i can see on the on the chat is do you think web-based OSCE exams opens up the opportunity to get globally every future doctor to the same level of competence oh yeah and i think <laughs> it's that's going towards almost like a not a national exam but a world exam in terms of starting to think I think nothing beats being able to be in front of someone to assess them face to face. I think no matter what the technology you have, any sort of web-based OSCE is not going to be as good as the real thing because you'd have to have almost five or six different cameras to get all the angles you're looking at. When you're assessing somebody in a clinical exam, you're assessing not just can they take a history and can they do an examination, what sort of eye contact? Do they do they you feel they build a rapport with people? How how did it look when they, they handled a limb if they were doing an examination? And therefore that's very difficult to assess through a web based So I think nothing beats actual face to face. So I no, I don't think it's a way of getting all levels for doctor. I think it's trying to think about how we have standards, each medical school has standards that the students need to achieve. And I think it needs, each country needs to let each of those medical schools make their decisions locally, but obviously, obviously have outside external people. We have external examiners on most programs, on all the programs within medicine. So they are basically are that gauge to say that we think that what you're doing with your students is correct. Great, okay. Um, and a question for Judy. Um, um, it's about plagiarism. Some, some teachers are, you know, concerned and worried that um, a lot of students are plagiarizing stuff. And what is the way of preventing, you know, um, um, students from doing such a thing? And how how can they ensure that they are giving them, you know, the right uh, and a fair um, mark? Okay, so there's two sides to cheating. <laughs> One is plagiarism. That's um, using somebody else's work as if it was your own. That's the definition of plagiarism. So what I would suggest for plagiarism, particularly with more essay-based type or short answer type work, put it through Turnitin, put it through Blackboard because Blackboard is your plagiarism, your Turnitin is your plagiarism software. Use the software that you would all already use. Okay. So that's plagiarism because that would pick up the plagiarism. If somebody's taking big chunks of text from a website or a journal article, Turnitin will pick it up. So use Turnitin, design your assessments so that you can use them to be submitted through Turnitin, even if the short answer is a short answer or essays, but put it in one document. Turnitin will pick that up really easily. The second thing is cheating. Now, cheating might be that you are putting, um, a, and that's why I was saying about recall exams. If you do recall exams and you don't know where your students are, I've just Googled that Open University thing while we're talking. It's so easy, isn't it? We can just Google something and find it, or somebody else might do it. So don't do recall exams. Or if you do recall exams, do them in such a tight time frame that the students have to do it. So it's timed tight to a minute almost, so that they have to know it because they haven't got time to Google. Okay, or for somebody else. Right. So that's one thing. The other thing is then looking more at saying, do you know, people might be tempted to cheat, but let's not assess recall. Let's assess our college and let's assess their ability to find things out and be able to 
um, evaluate the knowledge that they're finding. That's real life, isn't it? We'll go on a, you know, if we're looking for a holiday, we'll go on a few sites and we'll go, I might trust this one, but I won't trust that one. We do that ourselves. So that's about the open book exam saying, you can use any resources you want. What we're really looking at is the way you appraise, evaluate and seek knowledge. And how do you formulate that? Again, that can be put through Turnitin. It could be an essay or it could be a series of short answers uh, for plagiarism. But actually, you, you're much more, what you're doing is actually, you're doing a much more pedagogically interesting thing with your assessment. You know, if we have exams where students have to write down everything they know about X or whatever, that's not really that's only using one part of your brain so let's get us let's stretch our students let's do that i i've always done open book exams for my my students i teach at master's level not undergraduate but it's always about you find the knowledge but i want to know that you've you've sought that you've appraised it and you know that source and you can cite it so that shift is a really good pedagogical shift for assessment actually um, because recall is one thing but actually being able to recall and use the knowledge and find the right is the way so I would say those are the sort of interesting shifts around um, looking at plagiarism a pl practical thing use turn it in or your other plagiarism software and for cheating they can't cheat because you're not asking them to cheat you're not asking them what they you know what you're asking them is to put into practice and explain what they found which is a different higher, sort of a higher order skill so they're my answers to that one really do you have any questions paul there no i look to i think i think all i think all the questions have been answered according to the chat has anybody yes, else got any other questions yeah i've got a question for judy again and somebody's asking you to elaborate more on the programmatic sequential assessment that you mentioned a while ago okay well programmatic assessment is actually take it is looking at the student learning journey as a journey and it's saying let's look at let's look at the program and how students learn and let's put those assessments in to time assessment of that learning for the next stage so programmatic assessment would very much look at um, thinking about the whole program and how the assessments fitted in that sequence so instead of thinking oh they do all the first year and then they do an exam and then they go to second year what you might think is they'd be doing these units or courses or modules let's assess those but one leads to the other so it's very much around um, thinking about the program and the journey of learning rather than um, thinking about well let's just have an exam at the end universities always had exams at the end of years it was a very traditional approach you know where everybody got together and blah. but i think now what we're trying to do is say let it, let's not look at every module as a separate thing and assess that because that's too bitty but let's actually think of how the assessment works through the program okay so for example going back thinking about health professions education unfortunately again but if you think about well first year students need to learn how to the basic anatomy and physiology the normal anatomy let's assess that they know that then let's look at some different examples of when it's abnormal psychology patho uh, pathology or physiology or anatomy what are the consequences of that let's assess that now the advantage for assessment is that you're checking that they're ready to go to the next stage do they understand the normal yes okay they're ready to think about the abnormal okay so you're sort of putting it in that programmatic way the way you want the learning to happen the advantage for the covid situation is you're already checking off these milestones through the year rather than waiting to the end and putting everything together and so if something happens which it will we'll have second waves third waves for you know it's going to be inevitable next academic year it's going to be a bump, another bumpy year so let's make sure that we know where our students are at you know sort of almost month or two months by two months and then we don't end up in a situation where 
we don't know where our students are at by the end of the year, which is what's happened a bit this year. So I think it's good pedagogy, it's good pedagogical practice, but also it's quite a, it, it, it puts some safety nets in, in for students and for us for, for next year. And it, and it builds up that ability to give students a lot more formative feedback as you go through as well. Yeah. But yeah. starting to think about, often we concentrate on the students who fail, and those who, who do very well. I think it's those people in the middle who perhaps need extra assistance. By programmatic assessment, you will pick up those a lot quicker and then mm. have more focused sessions perhaps with them, starting to think how they can get better. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think this is the last question, but it is um, for the teachers themselves and their professional development. It seems like they were forgotten and um, um, now they feel a little bit um, jealous that um, they weren't given that much care. I mean, most, um, <laughs> the <talk> was, <laughs> most of the talk was, I mean, for the students. Now they're asking where, I mean, um, don't they need to be also given some uh, kind of, you know, um, uh, programs, training, in order to cope with, you know, the, um, the, the, this paradigm uh, change in, um, in education and assessment. Absolutely, and when we're allowed to come back, that's what we'll be doing with your teachers. <laughs> we hope the faculty development will happen. <laughs> but we're happy to do some more online faculty development because, you know, all the time, what we're almost saying is go back to basics, go back to the basics of teaching and learning and education and how it happens. So if you've got the basics under your belt, you can then adapt to different situations. And we're happy to do more faculty development with you. We've already got a bit, you know, we've been back with, we're not banned, that would be the wrong word. We're, we can't travel at the moment and it doesn't look likely for a lot of, uh, quite a while. But you know, we're happy to do more faculty development, going back to those core principles of why we do what we do. And if you stick to those core principles, you very much then can adapt to different situations and that's why we put the purpose and the principles of assessment at the beginning and curriculum alignment because you're always back to that and then of course the, pra the practicalities of how to choose the right assessment how to administer it etc is another issue but you know it's always back to basics and that helps you make your decisions around learning and teaching and why you and then you can justify your decisions as well because you've made them according to good pedagogy really so i would think yes it's but it's always back to those educational principles and why we do what we do and why we do it this way um but yeah we're happy to do some more work with you and faculty development for the teachers the teachers are so important the learners yeah. are important, obviously. And, and, Otherwise, and, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be a university. But we didn't have the teachers. We also yeah. wouldn't have a university. So, a lot a lot of people, I think, have become frightened recently of of using all the technology. And I think some people are trying to use their technology in different ways. I think what you need to do is, as Judy said, go back to the basics. How can I deliver what I would normally deliver, but using the technology I've got? And I think. Yes, there has been an opportunity, and I think one of the opportunities is to develop new ways of learning. But I think sometimes Judy and I have delivered very similar sessions that we would have normally delivered, but through Zoom. Mm. We've still been able to put people in small groups as we would as if we were in a room teaching people. And I think, therefore, you mustn't forget your basic principles. Think about what, what am I going to try and achieve? And then it's a case of learning how to use that platform. And sometimes yeah. we need assistance. The university at the moment is running sessions on what we call Zoom Basic and Zoom, Zoom Advanced. And it's starting to teach our, it's not teaching our lecturers how to teach. What it's teaching them is to use a platform so they can carry on the teaching that they've normally been doing, but delivering it in a slightly different way. And I think we just need to be not frightened of what we don't know. Mm. Well, I then okay. So it is. It is like maybe. I mean, um, um, a suitable name for that could be like adapt or perish. Maybe it's like you know. I think we need to work with the people who struggle with it. So yeah, adapt, 
And this is the essence of the situation. I mean, most of the teachers are sticking to their like old rules and they're not adapting to uh, the new situation. And I mean, um, maybe the, 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 the way it should be. I mean, um, I, just a question that I just received now, somebody's asking um, about the strategy that, uh, I mean, um, one can use for open book exams because people are not used to do, th to do that. So if yeah. you could like um, briefly um, comment on this. Okay, I'll do that. I'm quite used to open book exams. So an open book exam, is really if you think about if you come away from thinking about undergraduates or say final year undergraduates or your master's students what you might require from those students is to you want what you're testing is can they find can they find the knowledge that they need do they know where to look, look for it has the source that they have um, chosen is it a reliable and a valid source is it you know is it bmj or is it you know wikipedia written by a strange person um can they utilize that knowledge and apply the knowledge to the question that you've asked them okay so that's the key so in an open book exam what you would do is you say you've got uh, so long it may be a day it may be three hours it may be a week you decide what that is open book exam is you can use any resources that you want but what we want you to answer is this question so when i did my mba this was all open book exams we were allowed to take at that time actual books in with us but now you would be able to use the internet and you'd be saying to somebody for example um uh, questions such as we'd like uh can you uh, can you analyze the well take the risk analysis right okay so if you were going to use a risk analysis for this situation can you choose a risk analysis choose a suitable risk analysis apply it to this situation come out with some recommendations for future practice okay this is what real life is all about isn't it and in that open book you might give them an hour and what they'd have to do then is work out what did do they know what a risk analysis is can they find them can they find one that works can they adapt it and can they apply it to this scenario that you've given them okay so very scenario based so you can use this in all sorts of disciplines uh, management i gave an example for that but you could use that in medicine and uh, health professions for a clinical scenario you could use it uh, in um, any discipline geography literature whatever so a lot of english for example english literature courses will use open book exams so it would be like um please take in the text of i don't know othello shakespeare's othello can you uh, can you please um identify the core themes of jealousy throughout the play all right you'd have iago and othello all being jealous and tra la la um, and that's the way you do it. So you think about what am I trying to achieve? What knowledge do I want the students to be able? Do I, I need to know that they know the right knowledge and that they can take it and they can apply it. Okay, so that's the essence of an open book exam. Um, and they're so common in particular master's courses, but I think we can take them into undergraduate and you could very much imagine doing that, you know, quite early on with uh, with the theoretical physics, with mathematics, with science. So you give them a scenario and they got to find the right information to put that in. You're not giving them the information. It's really different. So you're not saying, this is all the information you need and now I'm gonna test you on it. Can you recall it? And do you know what that means? And can you apply it? What you're taking a step back and you're saying, you need to find the information okay and you need to apply it so that's the essence of an open book thank you judy anything to add paul no i think that's and it reminds me of a film i saw a while ago um <laughs> uh, talking about stephen hawkins and stephen in, in the film it, it portrays him being given 10 problems to solve mathematical problems and he does them very quickly and the people in his class quite can't quite believe he's done it and it, to me, he was, because he'd been able to do it, you, in effect, you do, he's got the understanding because he was able to come up with the answer. What you need to think about is asking questions that do that. Yeah. How do I know that the answer has been derived because the students had the research in it, 
or is it is not just regurgitation of knowledge mm. if, 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 if you ask a regurgitation of knowledge you go on the internet and search but you need to ask questions that if you if you searched on the internet they wouldn't give you the answer they might give you a few pointers about things that you could use to get the answer but you have to derive the answer it's not a simple yes or no or the answer is 42. yes mm. it's starting yeah. to change the, the way in which we write questions yeah yeah a proper maybe a proper marking rubric maybe um should be in place before um students are given these uh, types of uh, you, you would have to define your assessment criteria very yeah carefully, which would be derived from your learning outcomes, so we're yeah. back to basics again. Define those assessment criteria before the rubric, the assessment criteria is sort of the key, and then you would ask the question, and then the, the, as you say, the marking rubric would then reward different parts of that. So part of it would be, was the source an, a, you know, reliable source and a valid source? Um, did they under, demonstrate understanding of the concept could they apply the concept to the scenario you've given yeah so they would be sort of the key elements of the rubric really thank you thank you very much so it seems like that um we're coming to the end of this um webinar tonight um, okay i'd like uh, first to express my warmest thanks to our wonderful speakers professor judy mackham and professor paul jones for their input Wonderful input tonight, and uh, to oh, my fellow organizers, Dr. Hani Berdisi, Engineer Hashim Al Ghalib, Dr. Mohammed Hassanain, Professor Hibad Dawsiri, Dr. Sarah Mukhtar, Dr. Rani Al Dawi, Dr. Wafa Sagaf, Dr. Majnoor, and it's me, Dr. Mohammed Barakati. Until we see you tomorrow in our session titled Promoting Research Excellence Towards 2030 Vision. Stay well and safe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.